Welcome back. So we've been talking about the fast Fourier transform and how you can transform data vectors into their Fourier coefficients. And now I'm going to tell you how you can use the FFT to approximate derivatives in this Python example. Okay? So in this example, what we're going to do is take a function where we know the derivative, we can analytically compute the exact derivative, and we're going to compare how accurate the FFT is compared with that analytic derivative, and we're also going to compare this against the simple finite difference derivative that you would kind of normally do on data, okay? So uh, in, this, in this Python code, we have some, uh, some, some data we're going to define on a range uh, L, so the length of our domain is going to be 30, and we're going to define our data from uh, minus L over 2 to L over 2, minus 15 to 15. Our function is going to be this cosine function times uh, this, this decaying Gaussian function. So it's basically a cosine in a Gaussian envelope. And we can analytically compute the derivative df using the chain rule here. So that's the perfect derivative machine precision. And now what we're going to do is we're going to approximate that derivative using both a finite difference scheme, kind of a, the simplest thing you could think of, and using the FFT or the spectral derivative. And we're going to compare how accurate they are. Now, this isn't kind of as exhaustive as you could possibly get. Um, the finite difference derivative is a really, really crude derivative. So here I'm literally going to approximate uh, the derivative at step k is going to be approximated by our function at k plus 1, the, the k plus 1th element, minus fk divided by delta x. We know that this is not a very good approximation of the derivative. This has error that scales like delta x, order delta x error. I could do a better job with like a central difference or a higher order finite difference, but this is really just uh, to illustrate, you know, a, a, another way you could compute things. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. The really uh, important part is um, is down here how we actually compute uh, the derivative using the FFT. And we always called this the spectral derivative. Um, so here's what you do. The first thing is you take the FFT of your function f uh, in f hat. And remember, if I took the Fourier transform, so we've already talked about this for continuous functions. If I take the Fourier transform of the derivative of a function with respect to x, we know that we can write that in terms of the product of i times the frequencies times the Fourier transform of f. Uh, so this is i times, sometimes I write this as omega, here I'm going to write this as kappa times the Fourier transform of f, or if you like, i times kappa times f hat. And I'm just going to make a note down here. I use kappa when I'm Fourier transforming in space. So these are spatial frequencies, spatial frequencies, uh, sometimes called wave numbers. Okay, you're going to hear wave numbers or spatial frequencies. Kappa is a vector of spatial frequencies. And I usually use omega when I'm Fourier transforming in time. So this is uh, space. Uh, omega is f from Fourier transforming in time. So we used omega before when we did dfdt. Omega would be temporal frequencies. Okay. Uh, but basically, kind of, they, they play the same role. It's just what I call them if I Fourier transform in space. I often call those frequencies kappa instead of omega. I just wanted to point that out. Um, so this is what you would do if you were working with the continuous Fourier transform or Fourier series. But it's a little bit more interesting in the, in the data case. If I have a, a vector of data and I'm doing the FFT, then this F hat is actually a vector of frequencies, uh, sorry, a vector of Fourier coefficients, and kappa is a vector of uh, frequencies. And so what you would do in the DFT world, or in the FFT world, is you would take I kappa 1 F1 hat, kappa 2 F2 hat, and so on and so forth. I'd take every frequency and multiply it by its corresponding Fourier coefficient and create a vector uh, of, you know, frequency weighted Fourier coefficients times I. And if I inverse Fourier transformed this vector, if I took the IFFT of this, I would recover the derivative of my data at those discrete sample points. Okay? So that's exactly what, uh, what this is doing here. I take the, the FFT and I put it in F hat. Uh, 
I create this kappa vector, which is basically a big vector of frequencies. So I take my kind of fundamental frequency unit, uh, 2 pi over L, and I multiply it by this, this vector from minus n over 2 to n over 2. And in most languages, you have to be careful about how you order and how you organize those frequencies into that kappa vector. So in most languages like MATLAB and Python, there's this FFT shift command. So if you define your, your frequencies this way, you run this FFT shift command and it orders them in the same ordering that's consistent with how it orders the frequencies in the fast Fourier transform. This is always a little confusing. Um, it's kind of a mess. Every language organizes these frequencies differently. Uh, and so basically you just have to remember these two lines of code. You create a vector of frequencies from minus n over 2 to n over 2 in these fundamental units. And then you run the FFT shift command and it'll reorder those into the right ordering of frequencies. That, that's just to make sure that those kappas are apples to apples with uh, what those frequencies in f hat correspond to, okay? But once you do that, it's really easy to compute the derivative. It's just kappa times f hat times uh, the square root of negative one, this, this uh, unit imaginary uh, number here, one j. And then to get my derivative in real spatial units, I just take the i FFT, the inverse FFT of, of this, this derivative um, i kappa f hat. Okay, um, and the, the upshot here is that all of these steps are very fast and very accurate. Okay, so the FFT, I can rapidly compute its order n log n. I can create this kappa vector, no problem. It's a little bit confusing, but you just run these two lines and you get a kappa vector. Then you can compute your derivative. It's i times kappa times f. And then you inverse Fourier transform to get the derivative back in spatial units. Okay, and because these are complex numbers, uh, in f hat, when you m multiply these out and inverse Fourier transform, you might have very, very small machine precision imaginary parts. So we're just gonna take the real part of this inverse Fourier transform. That's just being careful. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot the analytic derivative of my function, my finite difference derivative of my function, and my Fourier transform spectral derivative of my function. And that's what we're doing down here. So in white, you see the, the true derivative. This is the machine precision analytic derivative. And then finite difference in yellow and FFT in red. And you see very clearly that the red, the, 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 the spectral derivative using the FFT almost perfectly agrees with the true analytic derivative, whereas my finite difference uh, deviates quite significantly. It's really, you know, there's a lot of error in my, my yellow curve here because we know that this finite difference is not, not very accurate. Okay, so this was not meant to be super quantitative or exhaustive. Um, actually, in our book, um, Data Driven Science and Engineering, you can find it at uh, databookuw.com and, and in the links. Uh, we actually go through this example a little bit more exhaustively. And so I'm just going to walk you through this here. So this is actually a more careful uh, study. As you increase the number of data points in your signal, which is the same as decreasing delta x, as you make delta x smaller or n bigger, it is absolutely true that this finite difference derivative does get more accurate, but it gets more accurate very slowly, okay? Um, whereas our spectral derivative, our FFT derivative, gets more accurate very, very rapidly. The more points I include in my data, the smaller delta x is, this FFT-based derivative gets much more accurate much more rapidly. And so you can tell that this error is on a log plot. And so I get maybe you know six or seven orders of magnitude increase in the error by just quadrupling the number of points. Okay, or, or even, yeah, quadrupling or doubling the number of points. So it's really, really uh, data efficient to compute these very accurate derivatives using the, the FFT, but not using finite differences. And I would actually uh, encourage you to write up a code to do this yourself. All it would require is taking this code I just show you, uh, showed you and wrapping a for loop around it for increasing n and making these plots. And you could then try higher order accurate, maybe a central difference scheme or a second order or a fourth order finite difference scheme. And you could see that those will in fact converge faster, but they won't converge as rapidly as the spectral derivative. The spectral derivative is really a much better way of computing the derivatives of clean, uh, of clean data. Okay, so very nice. We're gonna use this property uh, to compute derivatives for solving PDEs. One more thing I wanna show you, and this is also in chapter two um, of our book, 
is what happens if you apply this to a function like the, the, pointy, the pointy hat function we looked at earlier. So even though f is continuous here, its derivative is discontinuous. So the derivative of f is zero, then it jumps to positive maybe one or one half, then it jumps to negative one half, and then it jumps back to zero at the end. And so that's a discontinuous derivative. And when I use the FFT to compute the derivative of this function, I get an approximate derivative that has the right features, but you can see that this Gibbs phenomenon is creeping back in. Okay, so because our derivative is discontinuous, when I use the spectral derivative, it's going to have that Gibbs phenomenon in it. So you have to be really careful. The FFT is great for spectral derivatives of smooth functions uh, whose derivatives are continuous. Okay, so you have to have the, the derivative be continuous or else you'll get this Gibbs phenomenon. Okay, good. So in the next few lectures, we're going to talk about how to use the FFT to solve partial differential equations, taking advantage uh, of this fast, efficient, accurate derivative uh, calculation. Okay, thank you.